Hey everybody, this is Mr. Johnson again. Um, this is lecture three, section 2.4, and I'm on page 98 of the ebook. One request I had was to um, be consistent about how I'm using page numbers, and from here on out, unless I make the mistake again, I'll be referring to the ebook page numbers, uh, which are a little bit different than the, the textbook. So section 2.4 is about how to name and write the formulas for inorganic compounds. We're going to learn today there's three types of inorganic compounds. There's ionic compounds, there's molecular compounds, and there's acids. In theory, you learned a little bit about each of those in your first year class, what differentiates them, how we can recognize them, and some of their properties and how they vary in their properties. I will be talking a little bit about that today, um, but I'll assume most of that is background knowledge. And frankly, if you aren't terribly comfortable with the differences between these compounds and how to tell them apart, it'll get revealed over time in this class. All right, so first going to talk about ionic compounds. And the first thing I want to mention or remind you of is how we, how we recognize them. If we're looking at an ionic compound, how do we know it's ionic? Well, our textbook tells us that ionic compounds contain only two types of monatomic ions. They're called ionic compounds because they contain ions a positive ion and a negative ion. So I'm going to click on this overlay here uh, and read to you what it says, which is that an ionic compound is usually a metal and a nonmetal, or a metal and a polyatomic ion. All right, well, I'm going to take you to a periodic table to remind you, or to tell you if you haven't been taught this, go away, pop up, um, how we tell metals from nonmetals. Well, here's a periodic table, um, and the entire left side of the periodic table, everything to the left side of this yellow zigzaggy line here are metals. On the other hand, the upper right hand corner of the periodic table to the upper right of this yellow zigzaggy line are where we find our nonmetals. Now within the group of metals, there's different names for different types of metals. We might talk more about that later. So is that true for nonmetals? These, for example, are called the halogens. These are other nonmetals. They don't have their own special name. And these are the noble or inert gases, which despite being nonmetals, tend not to ever show up in compounds because they already have a full valence shell. And that's one reason why, or the primary reason why, atoms form compounds is in order to get a full valence shell, which makes them a little bit more stable. So if it's a, a metal and a nonmetal, and the metal will always be listed first in the formula or in the name, then we would know it's an ionic compound. For example, if we saw Na and O together, it's called sodium oxide, by the way, we'd know it's an ionic compound. What an ionic compound always has is a positive ion, a cation, and a negative ion, an anion. And that positive ion is almost always a metal, and that negative ion, that anion, can be a nonmetal, just like we talked about. Well, the other common option for that negative ion or anion is what is called a polyatomic ion or a polyatomic anion. So instead of maybe seeing sodium and oxygen in the ionic compound, sodium being a metal and oxygen being a nonmetal, you might see sodium and chlorite. Chlorite being the negative ion, the anion. In that case, it's a polyatomic ion. So like the overlay said, an ionic compound will pretty much always have a metal first. And second in the formula or the name will either be a non-metal negative ion, a non-metal anion, or a polyatomic negative ion, or a polyatomic anion. The only exception to that is that the one positive ion that you might see in an ionic compound that isn't a metal is ammonium. So the first component in an ionic compound, instead of it being a metal, might be ammonium. And that's an NH4 one plus ion. We'll talk more about polyatomic ions in just a little bit. And I meant to mention that this ion sheet that's in the back of our book is on page 562 of our ebook, and you can see that it's on page 554 of the actual textbook. These are just some of the common ions. These are the ones that in this class we want to be most comfortable with. Um, there are lists of ions that include far more than this, if you're interested in looking at a few more. So the next thing I want us to look at is this statement here, which says that the name of any ionic compound is the name of the constituent metal ion, whatever that metal ion is called, followed by the name of the constituent non-metal ion. Basically, it's the name of the positive ion followed by the name of the negative ion. 
Some of those I recommend memorizing, but you can often look them up on your ion sheet if you're not sure what they are. And as it mentions here, we got the back of our book, which is where we see those lists of ions. We'll practice naming these compounds in a moment, but I want to mention first before we do that, that ionic compounds are always electrically neutral. The total charge in an ionic compound is always zero. The total positive charge from all of the cations will be equal and opposite to the total charge on the or all the negative ions. And the reason for that is if we realize that ions form such that the metal loses its valence electrons in order to get a full valence shell, and the nonmetal gains typically the metal's electrons to get a full valence shell, because of the conservation of matter or mass, however many electrons are lost by the metal is equal to the number of electrons that are gained by the nonmetal. And the total number of electrons that are lost by the metal ion or the metal ions is the total positive charge. So too is the total number of electrons gained by the nonmetal ion or ions equal to the total negative charge. So it's due to the transfer of electrons that accounts for these charges and for these compounds being overall electrically neutral. So I just flipped to the next page of my ebook, and at the top, again, we see that all compounds are neutral. There's no such thing as a charged, at least ionic compound, or a charged compound at all, actually. We talked a bit about how we'll name the ionic compounds. I'll practice that with you in a moment. This section is about how we write the formulas for ionic compounds. Assuming you know what the charge is on each ion, either because you figured it out based on where it is on the periodic table, you've memorized it, or you've looked it up on the ion sheet. Once we know what the charges are on the ion, we want to write a formula for that compound that allows the compound to be overall electrically neutral. Some of you might do this intuitively and do it in your head. Some of you might know that if a 3 plus ion combines with a 2 minus ion, there needs to be two 3 plus ions and three 2 minus ions for the compound to be neutral. The, the easiest way to do it, though, it's actually how I do it, it's faster, is what's called the crisscross method. And that's where you take the charge for the anion, which in this case is 2 minus, and make it the subscript for the cation, the positive ion. Meanwhile, you take the charge of the cation, the 3, not the plus, the 3 from aluminum, and that becomes the anion subscript. And we see that over here. The charge number for our sulfide was a 2 minus, that's aluminum subscript, and the charge number for aluminum was a 3 plus, that becomes sulfide's subscript. So that's a shortcut for doing this. Keep in mind, though, that if you do that, which again is fine, you might need to reduce. If you were to look at lead... Four, I just had to think for a moment, sulfide's charges, you'd see that lead is a 4 plus ion and sulfide is a 2 minus. And then when we crisscross, sulfide would become, sorry, lead subscript would become a 2, sulfides would become a 4, but because ionic compounds formulas always want to reflect the lowest whole number ratio of ions, you reduce that 4 to 2 to 2 to 1, and it becomes just PBS2. All right, so I've just scrolled down a little bit. I'm on the same page. I'll do a couple practice problems with you in a moment. I just want to talk with you briefly about what are called multivalent ions. Multivalent ions are arising from metal atoms, typically transition metals, the ones in the middle of the periodic table, that have more than one option for how many valence electrons they can lose. And we'll talk about it later why. So the transition metals, many of them, not all of them, because they can lose different numbers of valence electrons can have more than one charge. They're called multivalent ions. Well, we've got to account for the fact that these multivalent ions or transition metals can have more than one charge in their name. We can't just say it's a copper ion because it could be copper one or copper two. We can't just say it's an iron ion because it could be iron one or iron two. So in the names of ionic compounds that have these multivalent ions in them, we have to use Roman numerals in their name to denote what charge that multivalent ion has. And this last sentence here is important to pay attention to. It says that the Roman numerals only appear in the compound's name, never in its formula. And the reason why is if the formula is written correctly, which we assume it would be, because we know the compound is overall electrically neutral, we could always figure out what the charge would be and what the Roman numeral would be on that ion based on 
the formula of the compound. And I'll model that for you in just a second. All right, so I'm going to do practice problem 1A with you, the top of page 100. We're going to write the formula for lithium sulfide. Um, I've written the ions and their charges down here because there isn't a whole lot of room up top. Um, how I knew that lithium was a 1 plus ion is possibly because if I go to my periodic table, I know that lithium is in column 1. And atoms in column 1 have just one valence electron. And when they lose that one valence electron, they become 1 plus ions. So these are always going to be 1 plus ions. These will always be 2 plus ions because they all have two valence electrons. Or I could go to the back of my book and find that lithium as an ion is a 1 plus ion. So those are the two ways you could know. Or maybe it's just memorized. Sulfide is a 2 minus ion um, for a similar reason, although I guess slightly different. It's in the second to last column. Uh, it means it has six valence electrons. Nonmetals tend to want to gain valence electrons to get to a full shell, which is eight. So sulfide will always gain two electrons to become an ion, and that's why it's a two minus. And that's true of oxide as well, selenide and telluride, which are fairly uncommon ions. All right. So we need to have figured out what the charges were on the ions. We know lithium's a one plus, sulfide's a two minus. We need to make the compound electrically neutral, so we figure out how many lithium ions are needed to be paired with sulfide ions to make it overall neutral. Uh, Crisscross will work here, so I can say, all right, well, sulfide's charge number is a 2 minus, there will be two lithiums. Lithium's charge is a 1 plus, there'll be one lithium, and I get L, I, 2, S. You could have also done that in your head if you want. All right, so now we're looking at Practice problem 1E on the same page, 10 to iodide. I'd like to acknowledge that tin is one of those multivalent ions. It's one of those transition metals that can have more than one charge. Uh, and that Roman numeral 2 is telling us that it's a 2 plus ion. The Roman numeral tells us the charge. It would also be found on our ion sheet in the back of our book. So that's why I've written tin 2 plus there. And iodide, because it's in the seventh column, will always form a 1 minus ion. And so too would my ion sheet tell me that. So I'm going to crisscross here real quick. It's going to be two iodides, one tin, and I get S, N, I, 2. Hopefully that doesn't feel too bad. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit more about polyatomic ions, which I mentioned briefly a bit ago when we were looking at our ion sheet. Um, the negative ion in an ionic compound, again, can either be a non-metal ion called a monatomic anion, or it can be a group of non-metals that are covalently bonded together. We'll worry about later if that doesn't make sense to you, um, that form a complex ion. So polyatomic ions, again, can be made of two or more non-metal atoms that are covalently bonded together, but that collectively have a charge. And we'll figure out later why that is. You won't need to memorize the names or formulas of any of these. In fact, there's relatively little memorization that we need to do in this class and to be successful on the AP test. But these are common enough that having to look them up all the time can waste time. So I do recommend that you try to memorize that nitrate is NO3 minus. It's one nitrogen atom and three oxygen atoms with together a one minus charge. Sulfate is SO4 two minus. Carbonate is CO3 2 minus, and then phosphate, I don't know why I didn't write this formula in, is PO4 3 minus. So those are the four that I would recommend memorizing. Nitrate, sulfate, phosphate, and carbonate. Our book then mentions that there's a couple of exceptions, um, and I guess I failed to mention that almost all of these polyatomic anions end in 8 or ite, and those that do all contain oxygen. Um, but there's one negative ion that doesn't end in H or I called hydroxide. That's OH1 minus, and that's probably another good one to remember. Hydroxide is OH1 minus. Another exception or confusing ion is, is what's called dichromate. It's cr 2072 minus. That's just what it's called, dichromate. Its name does not suggest there's two chromates, because chromate is itself another ion. It's CrO42 minus. I find it to be annoying it's called dichromate, but it is. Just know that dichromate is one single ion that is Cr2O72 minus.
So I've flipped to the next page of our ebook. We're on, now on page 101 of our ebook, and I'm doing practice problem 1b on that page. Silver nitrate is what I'm about to write the formula for. Um, I've written the formulas and charges for the ions. Silver is a 1 plus ion. That would be on our ion sheet in the back of our book. And nitrate is NO3 1 minus. Maybe we don't need to crisscross now because two ones are going to give us two subscripts of ones. And so the formula of this is just going to be A, G, N, O, 3. Notice that I didn't put nitrate in parentheses. Shortly will I put a polyatomic ion in parentheses. The reason I didn't need to this time is there's only one nitrate. And if there's only one of a polyatomic ion, that's when you don't need to put it in parentheses. All right, now we're looking at 1E, aluminum dichromate. Again, that's that annoyingly named ion. It's not two chromates, it's just one. Uh, I've written the ions and their charges. Aluminum is a 3 plus and dichromate is a 2 minus. And I've done my crissing and crossing. So we're going to end up with two aluminums, in this case, and three dichromates. Because there's now more than one of that polyatomic ion, there's now three of them, put the whole thing in parentheses, and the 3 goes outside. So it's Al2, parentheses, Cr207, subscript 3. That's a little 3 over there, even though it's hard to tell. All right, so now we're on practice problem 2C, and we're looking at what looks like a compound with copper in it and a polyatomic ion called hypochlorite. You could look that up. That's just something that I, I remember. So earlier, you heard me say that the name of an ionic compound is simply the name of its constituent ions. Copper is the positive ion. Hypochlorite is the negative ion. And I, I might be inclined to just write copper hypochlorite. But because copper is one of those multivalent ions, and you just have to remember which are, it needs a Roman numeral in its name for us to know whether it's copper 1 or copper 2. The formulas of those two compounds are different. They have very different properties, so it's important in our name we distinguish if it's copper 1 or copper 2. Well, what I do is I ask myself, what would copper's charge in this compound need to be for the compound to be neutral? The answer to that is if hypochlorite is a 1 minus ion, which it is, and there's two hypochlorites, the total negative charge from those two negative ions is 2 minus. Well, if there's one copper ion canceling out that 2 minus charge, then its charge would need to be 2 plus. So in this case, copper is a 2 plus ion. If there had only been one, though, hypochlorite ion, then that would have been copper 1 plus instead of copper 2. So in this case, if we write copper, Roman numeral 2, I put it in parentheses, and I'm going to start writing diagonally hypo. Ooh, that's very unattractive. That says hypochlorite, if you can't tell. All right, so we're looking at 2D now. We would know it's an ionic compound, other than that it's in that section about ionic compounds because sodium is a metal, and this is a polyatomic ion. And frankly, whenever that first element is a metal, we know it's ionic. So we just name the two ions. Na is sodium. So I write sodium. And then CH3COO we would find on our polyatomic ion sheet, and it's called acetate. And so this one is sodium acetate. Because sodium is not one of those multivalent metals or multivalent ions, I don't need a Roman numeral there. This is simply the name of the two ions. Just to verbally walk you through E, Mg is magnesium. That's the name of the ion. That ion is called iodide, so this one is magnesium iodide. All right, so we've just scrolled down now. We're on the same page. We're, on, we're still on page 101 of our ebook, and I'm looking at this little overlay here about molecular compounds. We're transitioning from naming and writing the formulas of ionic compounds to doing the same for molecular compounds, which is actually a bit easier. I want to remind you again, ionic compounds are a metal and a non-metal negative ion, or a metal and a polyatomic negative ion. Molecular compounds, on the other hand, always contain two non-metal atoms. 
And they're not ions. They're not ions. They remain relatively neutral. But we'll talk more about that later. So molecular compounds are fairly recognizable because both elements are nonmetals. And frankly, if the first element is a nonmetal, so will the second be a nonmetal. Because these aren't charged, and because their charges don't dictate a predictable ratio and therefore a predictable formula, we cannot just say the name of a molecular compound without indicating how many of each nonmetal there is. We're able to do that for ionic compounds. We can't for molecular. So for molecular compounds, and in a way it makes it easier, we use prefixes to denote or to indicate how many of each nonmetal atom there is in the compound. I've just flipped to the next page. I'm now on page 102 of our ebook. And in the upper left hand corner, we see the prefixes up to 10 that we use for naming molecular compounds. In fact, these prefixes get used for other things, one being for naming hydrates, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Prefix for one is mono, two is di, three is tri, and on down the line. Tetris, by the way, is called Tetris because every shape that falls out of the sky has four squares in it. All right, something else to know about molecular compounds is that they always end in the "-ide suffix." The ending of the second nonmetal in the name is always going to be "-ide." The first nonmetal ending doesn't change. I'll show you what I mean by this in a moment, but the second nonmetal ending always changes to "-ide." As well, we don't ever use mono for the first element. If there's just one of the first element, we don't use mono. But if there is one of the second element, we do use mono. So I've just scrolled down. I'm still on page 102 of our ebook here, and I'm doing practice problem 1A. Here's the name of a molecular compound. We would know it's molecular because both nitrogen and oxygen are nonmetals, or nitrogen being a nonmetal means oxygen will as well. Notice there's no prefix in front of the first element, and that's because there never will be if there's just one. So nitrogen really means mononitrogen, so there's just one nitrogen. So I write N, and then there is just one oxygen, and we do use mono for the second element always. It's NO. Notice that the second element ends in I'd in the name, but the first one doesn't. So when we name these, we want to account for that. I'm going to jump to 1D now. We got dinitrogen, which means there's going to be two nitrogens. And tri is the prefix for three. Oxide is for oxygen, so N2O3 is my formula. Wow, that is, that is very nice looking. All right, coming down to 2D now. We're going to go from the formula to the name. And that's where we first acknowledge what the pre, excuse me, what the subscript is. So that's two, the prefix for two is di. P is for phosphorus, and remember the first nonmetal doesn't have its ending change, so I just say phosphorus. That says phosphorus. And then the prefix for 5 is penta. Again, the prefix for 5 is penta. I just rewrote diphosphorus, attempting to make it look nicer. Might have been a failed attempt, and I've already finished the name. So um, penta ends up being pent. Um, if you attach the prefix penta to oxide and you say it really fast, pentaoxide, pentaoxide, you notice you sort of naturally drop the A, and in this case you do. So pentaoxide goes to pentaoxide. If there were three oxygens, if it were trioxide, we wouldn't drop the I because it feels fairly natural to say trioxide. Okay, so we're moving on from naming and writing the formulas for molecular compounds, which again entails prefixes and involves two nonmetals in a compound together, sharing electrons, which we'll talk more about later. We're moving on now to a subtype of ionic compounds called hydrates. Um, our book refers to the word salt here, uses the word salt here, excuse me. Salts are another name, for the most part, for ionic compounds. Lots of ionic compounds are often made in solution. They'll crystallize or precipitate out of an aqueous environment, out of solution. And when they do that, they often incorporate some water molecules in their ionic lattice or in their crystal structure. Um, so too, if we just had a dry ionic compound that wasn't made through crystallization out of solution, it could incorporate water from the air and become hydrated. 
So many ionic compounds, when they're exposed to moisture or formed in the presence of most moisture, incorporate water molecules within their ionic lattice or matrix, um, and then they're called hydrates. It doesn't really change their properties so much, but it dramatically affects their molar mass, which matters to us when we use these in math problems. Uh, and so we got to account for them in their name and in their formula. So I've just flipped the page. I'm now on 103 of my ebook, and I'm going to do a couple of practice problems for you where we write the formula and then the name of a hydrated ionic compound. Fortunately, you won't ever need to know whether a compound is hydrated or not because in its name, it will be indicated with the word hydrate at the end, or in its formula, it will also be indicated with the presence of water molecules at the end of an otherwise normal looking formula. So if we're going from the name to the formula of a hydrate, we first write the formula of the ionic compound as we normally would. Barium is a 2 plus ion, chloride is a 1 minus ion, so it will end up being BACL2. And then we've got to put a dot, I'm not sure why it's a dot, but it is, a dot after the formula, and then the prefix di means 2. We use the same prefixes for hydrates we did for molecular compounds. So we put a 2 out front, and then hydrate translates to water. And I'm not sure why the convention isn't to put water in parentheses and a subscript, out, subscript outside of it. It just isn't. So there's barium chloride dihydrate. If we go down to 2D, we'll go backward. We'll go from the name to the formula. Um, excuse me, I misspoke. The formula with the name. Mg stands for magnesium. SO4 stands for sulfate. And then that's going to be heptahydrate. I'm not going to write that out. I don't want to disenchant you once again. But again, the name of that is going to be magnesium sulfate hepta for seven hydrate. Magnesium sulfate heptahydrate. All right. We're chugging along. We talked about ionic compounds, molecular compounds, hydrated ionic compounds. Now we have, excuse me, now all we have left to talk about are acids. I do want to say, though, that we don't really do that much naming or formula writing in this class. It's just sort of a background or a side skill. Um, so I want you not to worry if this feels overwhelming or if you feel like you'll never be great at this. You can be a magnificent chemist and be highly successful in this class if you're not great at writing the names or formulas of compounds. Definitely helpful, but not crucial for your happiness in life or success in this class. All right, so acids, our book says, um, can be thought of as one or more H plus ions bonded to an anion. Or we could also say that acids are ionic compounds whose cation, whose positive ion is hydrogen. When they dissolve in water, they therefore release this hydrogen ion, which is extremely small and highly reactive and makes acids behave the way they do. Our entire two last units of this class are about acid-base chemistry, and we talk tons about the properties of acids and bases there, and it's really interesting. I've written the formulas of a couple, of, excuse me, I've written to the formulas of a couple of acids here, and we would know from their formula they are acids because they have H as the cation. As well, all acids to function as acids, to be able to donate hydrogen ions to solution, need to be dissolved in water. So we should see, after the formula of an acid, in parentheses AQ, which stands for aqueous, meaning that that substance has been dissolved in water, allowing it to actually function as an acid. So here's HCl. It's called hydrochloric acid. We'll talk about why in a moment. And here's H2SO4, called sulfuric acid, which I'll also teach you how to name in a moment. Our book addresses one set of rules for naming acids, which work. They work totally fine. But I use mnemonics, which I find fun and easier to use to name acids. So if we click on this overlay here, we're going to see the mnemonics that I use and that I will be teaching you for how to name acids. If these don't work for you and you want to read this section of your book and do it differently, that's totally fine as well. Whichever method you choose, the important thing to know is that the name of the acid is based on the anion that hydrogen is with. The name acid implies H plus is the cation, so we don't need to account for that in the name besides using the word acid at the end. Rather, the name of the acid, like hydrochloric or sulfuric or nitric, 
is telling us what the anion is associated with the H plus ion. And then the word acid again tells us that H plus is the cation. So I'm going to click on this overlay for us to see the mnemonics that I use for teaching how to name acids. And I had to pause myself and figure out what was up. I couldn't click on the overlay because when something is highlighted and overlaid, you can't click on the overlay. So I just unhighlighted it. Anyways, here we go. Oh boy, that needs to get bigger. I can't seem to figure out how to make it bigger, so I hope you can see it um, and can read along with me as I go. So the first mnemonic is, if you ate it, it's icky. If you ate it, it's icky. Not that you should eat icky things, although I often do, but that's the mnemonic. Or you could say it backward and say, if it's icky, you ate it. Well, what is this all about? Again, naming acids is based on knowing what the name of the anion is and naming the acid after the anion. So let me walk you through an example. If we were to look at HNO3 and recognize that NO3 is the negative ion called nitrate, we would then say, okay, it ends in eight. That's what the eight is about. If you ate it, this is called nitrate. Or maybe it's SO4 in the acid, and that's called sulfate. If the anion ends in eight, then we use the, if you ate it, it's icky mnemonic. All right. Well, what we then do is change the ending eight from nitrate to nitric. If you ate it, it's icky. Nitrate becomes nitric, and then we add the word acid at the end. If you ate it, it's icky. If nitrate is the anion in the acid, nitrate becomes nitric, and it's called nitric acid. If it were chlorate, HClO3, if it were chlorate that were in the acid, We'd say if you ate it, it's icky, and the name of that acid would be chloric acid. If the anion ends in eight, the acid name ends in ick. All right, the next mnemonic is dynamite is danger us. Dynamite is danger us. Same idea there. If the anion ends in ite, excuse me, if the anion name ends in ite, then we change it to O-U-S and add the word acid. So I'm looking at H2SO3. SO3 is called sulfite. Dynamite is danger us. I change sulfite. Oh my goodness. And I'm back. I realized that I had a little typo in here. And one thing I'm trying not to do today is too many takes and go back and edit it. I spent about five times more time editing the last video than it took me to shoot it. And it wasn't the best use of my time. So every once in a while we're going to have some, some bloopers. All right, so. Sulfite becomes sulfus. Dynamite is danger us. But notice this isn't sulfus acid, it's sulfurous acid. And that's because, and I say this, sulfur likes its ours. Instead of sulfus acid, it's sulfurous acid. And if you said sulfus, people would know what you meant. Meanwhile, if we had phosphite as the anion, phosphite as the anion, it would be H3PO3. We'd say dynamite is dangerous, and instead of phosphite becoming phosphus, because phosphorus also likes its R's, it's phosphorus acid. So sulfur and phosphorus like their R's, we just bring those R's back into their name. All right, last one. Hydraulics for a smooth ride. This one is a bit weird, a little bit harder to apply, but let me give it a go. Hydraulics, hydraulics for a smooth ride. If the anion ends in ide, that's what ide is for, ide. If the anion ends in ide, then the acid name will start in hydro, but end in ick. So this one we use backward. If the anion ends in ide, then the acid name starts in hydro and ends in ick. The only acids that start with the prefix hydro are those whose anion ends in ide. Notice neither of these acids above, nitric, sulfurous, had hydro in the beginning. So just because an acid has H in it doesn't mean it will start with hydro. Again, only acids whose anion ends in ide start with the prefix hydro, which is confusing and I find annoying. So HCl has chloride as the anion, so we say, all right, for a smooth ride, we use hydraulics. Then the acid name starts in hydro, so we start with hydro. We stick with chlor from chloride and we add it chloride becomes hydrochloric, 
and we always add the word acid at the end. If it were HI, iodide also ends in ide. We'd say, all right, hydraulics for a smooth ride. So that time I put hydro in the beginning and it becomes hydroiodic acid. Hydroiodic acid. All right, so let's practice this. I've now flipped the page. I'm on page 104 of our ebook, and we're going to do practice problem 1A, 1B, 2A, and 2D. So I'm looking at 1A first. Hydrofluoric acid. It starts in hydro, and it ends in ic. So that means the anion ends in ide. The anion ends in ide. So I find the root of this word, which is fluor, and I say to myself, okay, well, it must have fluoride in it. It must have fluoride in it. Fluoride, either from memory or the periodic table or my ion sheet, I know to be a 1 minus. So the anion is F1 minus. Remember, all acids have H1 plus as the cation, so the cation will be H1 plus. And when I crisscross or just do it in my head, I say, okay, well, it's just HF. And then please be in the habit of putting AQ, if you can, in parentheses after the formula so we know it can function as an acid. All right, so let's look at 1B. We got hypochlorous acid. Doesn't start in hydro. Ends in OUS. So I say, all right, danger us is dynamite. I'm then looking for the root of this word, which is hypochlor, which means the anion is hypochlorite. Hypochlorite. Well, there's hypochlorite, there's chlorite, there's chlorate, and there's perchlorate. So try to keep them from being confusing. But hypochlorite is ClO1 minus. That's the formula and charge of hypochlorite. Meanwhile, all acids have H1 plus as the cation. So maybe you don't need to crisscross because it's 1 plus, 1 minus. I'm going to write it off to the right here. We get H. C-L-O, and again in parentheses, A-Q. There's hypochlorous acid. All right, we are almost done. We're going to do 2A, 2D, and I think that will wrap us up. So let's acknowledge 2A is an acid, and even though the subscripts A-Q aren't there, let's assume they are and they should be. And it's got H plus as the cation, so we know it's an acid. Um, so I then ignore the H for a moment, and I look at the anion, which is CH3COO minus. I go to my ion sheet, or I remember that that's called acetate. The name of this anion is acetate. I focus on the suffix eight, and I say if it's aided, it's icky. So acetate becomes acetic or acetic acid, which is what's in vinegar, by the way. And that is the name of this bad boy, acetic. Oh, goodness. Acetic acid. That's a T, by the way. All right, D, H, I. I ignore the H for a moment, because I know all acids have H in it. I focus on I. I is called iodide. Iodide. The suffix is ide. So then I think of hydraulic X for a smooth ride, and I know that this is the one type of acid when the anion ends in ide that starts with hydro. So I get hydro. I keep the iode, right, hydroiode, and the ide becomes ic, hydro, iode, ic, acid. Not too bad, hydroiodic acid. That's it, folks. Mr. Johnson signing off. Um, thanks for staying with me today. Thanks for being a great audience, for all your love and support. And if scientific notation and sig figs and measurement and naming ionic compounds isn't enchanting you, don't worry. There's plenty more fascinating topics coming your way. And if you have enjoyed this, so have I. Be well.